Hello everybody, welcome back to HDTWF uh, um, YouTube channel. In this video, uh, I will be uh, trying to um, transform this uh, very old and dirty um, black and white uh, small TV set, uh, probably from the early 70s or what, end of the 1960s to a uh, vector monitor for my um, ongoing uh, Atari Asteroids uh, mini uh, cabinet uh, res board restoration uh, and so you have probably seen uh, the first video in the series dealing uh, with the uh, Asteroids uh, PCB boards so I'm out uh, in the garden and I'll go and wash at least uh, the front of the CRT and then open uh, uh, this TV and see what we find inside but uh, first of all um, I will explain uh, what's the difference between a, a regular black and white uh, TV set and uh, vector monitor which is what we uh, would like to end with to use the uh, um, Atari Asteroids board and uh, make a, a new mini cabinet for it so stay tuned here we can see uh, the cathode ray tube that's inside the little TV set and um, this is a close-up of its uh, part number sticker and the description of this video below I'll link the Wikipedia page about CRTs and the data sheet of the Telefunken A28-14W uh, uh, since I couldn't find a scan of the Philips one if we have a look on uh, the CRT manual, we can find uh, this little schematic of the tube internal structure. Um, here I have added some uh, drawings and voltages um, to better understand how uh, uh, CRT works. First we need to apply a voltage, uh, which is 11 volts for this particular tube, to the filament. This is also called the ether. It is much like the filament of the old incandescent light bulbs. Um, its function is to bring the nearby cathode to the proper working temperature. At a sufficiently high temperature, the cathode starts losing electrons in the nearby space. Uh, but the proper term, uh, it's uh, the cathode emits electrons. These electrons are uh, what in the old days were called uh, cathode rays. Uh, now we all know that uh, the electrons are uh, tiny negative charged particles. Uh, negative charged things tend to move uh, towards positive voltage potentials. So since we don't want them to hang around the cathode doing nothing, uh, we'll start supplying a whole lot of voltages to the other uh, structures uh, of the CRT. So we start from the other end of the tube and we have a metallic structure that's connected to a very high positive voltage which for this particular tube uh, should be around 11 kilovolts, uh, that's uh, 11,000 volts. Some other cylindrical structures close to the cathode are also connected to this very high voltage and these uh, structures are called anodes. Uh, the very high voltage of these electrodes make the electrons accelerate at high speed towards the face of the screen. So at the end ele electrons hit a glass surface coated with phosphors. A phosphor is a particular material that emits light when uh, it is hit by electrons in this case. In this particular tube, the phosphor emits white light, but there are green, blue and amber monochromatic CRT too. Uh, but these have uh, been used only mostly for oscilloscope screens and computer monitors. 
So if we don't connect anything else, uh, as I'm showing on this uh, oscilloscope CRT picture, uh, we only have a blob of unmodulated light on the screen. Uh, but we have uh, still uh, some other structures inside uh, the CRT uh, to turn the electrons into powerful image makers. Um, by the way, all these internal structures are called electrodes. Uh, as I said also in uh, other parts of this uh, video. So first we have the ones labeled G2 and G4. And by the way, the G stands for grid, uh, for historical reasons. Uh, but on a CRT they are actually more like uh, small cylinders again, like the anodes. Uh, on some other brands manual, they are in fact indicated as A1 and A3. Um, the high voltage anodes in the in that case become, become A2 and A4. So, as we said, by applying some positive voltages to these two electrodes, we can convince the uh, electrons to group in a tight beam and make a very small uh, dot on the screen. So, in this image, we see the uh, highly focused uh, um, electron beam on the same CRT uh, of the, the same oscilloscope. Uh, so these are the focusing electrodes. Uh, and again, I have indicated on the picture the typical values for, for the CRT I'll work with. Uh, however, this voltage mu must be made ton uh, tenable with uh, potentiometers. Uh, to focus the image because of uh, slightly variations on CRT and surrounding uh, magnetics and electrics uh, fields. But we are not yet done. At this point, uh, the highly focused beam will just instantly and permanently burn through the phosphors. In fact, on the image uh, with the focus at the spot, I had to uh, turn down uh, uh, very much the brightness on the oscilloscope. Uh, we need a way to modulate the electron quantity that reach the screen and a way to make the beam move around on the surface of the whole screen and draw interesting things. Now we can control the number of the electrons going to the screen by varying the voltage between the cathode and uh, G1. G1 is the control grid or simply the grid on metals that call all other electrons as anodes. G1 is very close to the cathode. Uh, the force that electrons uh, feel uh, to move away from the cathode follows an inverse square law. So since G1 is so close, with a small voltage variation, we can convince all electrons to remain on the cathode area and have a completely extinguished screen or have them all happily fly towards the screen and make the brightest like spot. Uh, the phosphor can make before burning out uh, if the spot is not moving anyway. Uh, in order to actually repel the electrons, the control grid must uh, have less voltage than the cathode. Uh, what really matters is the difference between the two voltages. Uh, the more the grid is negative with respect to the cathode, the less electrons will uh, they are passing through. Uh, on some TV and monitors, uh, like in the one I have found, uh, the grid is simply permanently grounded and the cathode voltage is made variable to modulate the beam intensity. On some other TVs uh, it's the contrary and we can have a grounded cathode and negative grid modulation voltage. As a last step we uh, need to make the electrons move anywhere in the screen surface and not uh, just stay put in the center and we can make them display whatever we like. Uh, let's look again at uh, our uh, CRT. That plastic assembly with the tightly coiled magnet wire is called deflection yoke or also deflection coils. There are two sets of separate coils. The horizontal coils are usually on the inside of the yoke and on the outside we have usually the vertical coils. Uh, now, it turns out that electric charge things uh, uh, will be subject to a force when moving through magnetic, magnetic fields. Uh, this force will make uh, the charge thing uh, to follow uh, curved paths instead of simply moving in the direction imposed by the electric fields. And yes, our electrons are of course the electric charge things. 
So by cleverly varying the magnetic fields produced by the deflection coils, we can make the beam in this CRT move to a total of 80 degrees angle on the horizontal plane and 63 degrees on the vertical plane. Now let's see how we can display whatever image we want on a black and white CRT. Uh, the mechanism is called rest scan. Um, the electron beam moves from left to right, uh, composing line by line the image to be displayed. And the uh, beam intensity is uh, varying according to the image brightness. The scanning is quite fast. A complete frame is displayed 20 times each second or 30 times, depending on where you live in the world. Of course, when the beam needs to get back at the beginning of a new line or at the beginning of a new frame, its intensity is set to zero, so we don't see any horizontal or vertical retrace lines, as they are called. The raster scan is a very powerful method. It can display whatever we like, from films on, on TVs to text on a computer monitor, uh, of course, any kind of graphics uh, for games. However, back in the old days, uh, this method had some drawbacks. For example, let's suppose we wanted to display uh, an image of 320 by 200 pixels, uh, where uh, each pixel can be either on or off. No shades of grey, so not terribly useful. Um, we uh, would need, uh, in our game, a memory area uh, that gets read as the CRT is scanning the frame, and provides the status of every pixel we want to display. So, uh, 320 by 200 uh, is exactly 64,000 bits. Uh, if we divide by 8, we get 8,000 bytes, which is almost 8 kilobytes. And that is in using any shade of grey, as we said. So, if we wanted, for example, uh, 4 shades, that would double the amount of memory required. And kilobytes were very expensive in the 70s. So, of course, there were all sorts of uh, tricks to reduce the amount of video uh, RAM needed, uh, like, uh, for example, sprites, uh, uh, character maps in ROM, and so on. Uh, but let's suppose if you wanted to display only an image like this, with uh, those moving objects uh, uh, and with some levels of uh, uh, grey, uh, there was a very clever alternative method. All the objects in this image are not drawn uh, with the electron beam scanning all the screen endlessly left to right and top to bottom. Instead, each object, uh, whether it is uh, a number or letter or the spaceship uh, or the asteroids, uh, everything, is drawn like you would do on a piece of paper with a pencil. The electron beam is steered to the place where an object is to be drawn. The intensity is turned up to the, ob to the level required for the wanted object. Uh, then the beam is moved in successive lines, uh, colored vectors, uh, to draw the anterior object. Then the beam intensity is again turned off and the beam is moved to go drawn uh, the next object. Very clever, isn't it? Uh, you have all your shapes in a uh, ROM, for example. You have to store in the expensive RAM only what object you want to display, where it begins and how bright must it be. Uh, so no fixed amount of video RAM needed anymore. Of course, uh, vector generators are not uh, exactly general purpose. Uh, they are not suitable to display very complex images. Uh, but by the early 80s, uh, there uh, was a good number of arcade games using vector graphic, uh, even with colors. Uh, uh, I have linked a list of uh, the ones that have a, a Wikipedia page, uh, of course, link in the description. Um, this image is from some of the most famous ones. Uh, this should give you an idea of what could be done. Now, if we have a vector game, what can we do without the original vector monitor? The first and obvious option will be looking for one on auction sites, for example. The problem is that these monitors are uh, enough rare. The second option is uh, uh, finding a Vectrex game console. 
This was a vector game console for home, uh, and as far as I know, it's the only one having vector graphic. And unfortunately, even a broken Vectrex is highly priced nowadays. Recently, I have found on Action site uh, the yoke assembly of a Vectrex monitor. No CRT, just the coils on the plastic support. Well, the price was almost as high as I, what I paid for the two asteroids PCBs. And also a Vectrex monitor needs some modifications to correctly display a typical arcade vector output. But this is what uh, Jürgen Müller did, however. You'll find a link to his fine website describing his Asteroids mini cabinet in uh, linked in the description. A third option would be displaying the game on a on oscilloscope display. Oscilloscope are often uh, an XY mode that's suitable for the typical vector output. The big problem with this is that uh, oscilloscope CRT uh, have green phosphors and have also an embedded grid into the screen. Also, they are usually too small to make a dozen sized cabinet. Uh, this, however, is the best option to display the output of a PCB when troubleshooting it. If none of the previous options work and you are desperate, like I think I am, the last option is attempting to build a vector monitor from the guts of an old TV set. Let's see what circuits we have inside a black and white TV, since we don't need a color display for asteroids anyway. Starting from top left we have uh, the tuner, this circuit selects one of the many stations that we receive from the antenna or cable TV and converts this channel to a common frequency called intermediate frequency or IF simply. However, we don't need this part for our X1 monitor. Then there is the IF amplifier and the modulator. Basically, these circuits amplify the IF signal and separate the video content from the audio but we don't need these parts for uh, our monitor. Then we have the audio circuits, FM demodulator and amplifier. Uh, guess what? We don't need them anymore. We might be wanting to reuse part of the audio amplifier though if our game PCB doesn't have one uh, um, audio amplifier built in. Then we find the video amplifier. That's the circuit that modulates the cathode to grid voltage to produce the light intensity shades from complete black to full white. Okay, we actually need a similar circuit on a vector monitor too, uh, but we have to make some modifications to it and we'll see later why. Now we have the sync separator and uh, the vertical and horizontal oscillators, also called time bases. These two oscillators make the electron beam constantly moving for the raster scan we have seen before. The sync separator extracts the information of start of frame and start of line, so the two chain bases can log to the synchronization signals, otherwise our image would continuously roll over. Since we don't have any synchronization and no raster scan, we don't need the circuits on a vector monitor. But we do definitely need the last block, which is the power supply and the EHT voltage for the CRT anodes. Notice, however, that the EHT and usually most of the other supplies needed for the CRT are generated with the help of the horizontal time base. Uh, this will be one of the challenges in successfully completing such a conversion. Uh, let's have a look now to a typical vector monitor block diagram. Basically, we have the block power supply and high voltage generator. Then we have uh, the intensity, which also called Z signal on a black and white game amplifier. Uh, and the image is shown a color monitor, so it has three separate signals, one for each color. Then we have the X and Y amplifier and the flexion drivers. And last but not least, the circuit called fail. This is a very important circuit. It senses the deflection outputs to the yoke, and in the event of no deflection outputs, either because of a game board failure or because of a failure in the monitor itself, 
immediately kills the high voltage supply to the CRT or in some other monitors it kills the beam brightness on the cathode or grid drivers. That's because in the absence of XY deflection all the beam energy will concentrate on a tiny spot and instantly burn the phosphors. The first circuit is commonly known as the spot killer. Uh, so now that we uh, have at least an idea about this conversion, I want to add some disclaimers. First of all, I never attempted such a conversion before and at this point I'm not even sure it will work at all. Uh, second, be aware that CRT circuits work with very high voltages. Um, CRTs may also implode if not handled very carefully. If you're not sure how to deal with this kind of circuits, you should not attempt to do something similar. Third, I have seen a few videos on YouTube of people modifying TV sets to display XY signals, like for example oscilloscope music. I will not link those videos as they were basically just disconnecting the yoke coils and hoping the TV power supply would still generate the needed EHT and biases. This is a risky thing to the attempt in my opinion. At the very least you are going to burn some spots in the phosphors if it works at all. I will attempt to rebuild the needle circuits uh, understanding how uh, they are supposed to work. Well actually I think I will uh, remove the, the cover and let it uh, dry faster. Uh, but first, since this will be probably um, discarded, uh, for uh, just out of curiosity, let's see what we find uh, on the back of this uh, old TV power cord uh, for mains power. Interesting, there is a battery 12 volt uh, input to run the TV from a, a car battery or. Uh, bot or something what which was a common thing uh, on these old TVs anyway at least in Italy uh, separate uh, VHF and UHF antenna inputs uh, these are the internal uh, um, this is uh, I think VHF one yeah or what I don't know it seems so because of the cable X thing on this side. So these are internal antennas that can be disconnected and you can connect uh, uh, external uh, antenna of course. In, so this set is lacking uh, um, a duplexer to have only one input for all the, the two bands which was a common thing also back in uh, the 70s, uh, at least in Italy. So you had an external box, if you had only one antenna on the roof, uh, you had uh, an external box uh, next to the TV that uh, had an input of the combined uh, signals and two outputs to go on the VHF and UHF um, inputs on the TV. So let's open it okay, on the inside the back side we find a very small uh, uh, PCB actually and it appears to have some reworks in the years this is a bridge rectifier made with uh, single uh, diodes I don't know if there was a, a bridge that filed there probably a selenium one maybe so I'll find out when I open. Uh, fuse. Um, there was one screw here, and there was another here, but it's missing. Uh, and you probably can flip the PCB and work on it uh, by removing uh, these two screws. The inside is still uh, uh, wet, but. Uh, let's try for a while now this has also germanium transistors these two is also this big one is uh, also germanium one some integrated circuits uh, 
made in Italy by SGS this one too date code seems from 1972 this is the missing place for the rectifier that has been uh, replaced with the uh, diodes we have seen on the back of the PCB well, 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 it's very old I have to at least uh, make it work for a while to check if it can focus uh, if the CRT is working, uh, if the deflection is working and so on so basically I need to make it work at least uh, for a short time no problems on the semiconductors it's time to fire the um, power for the first time I just connected the uh, 12 volt supply on the right place where the wires uh, from the 12 volt sockets come on the PCB and here is uh, the power supply and I'm checking first the 11 volts on the tube socket for the filament where the filament of the CRT is connected disconnecting the tube socket uh, on the first power on is a good idea because if the uh, filament voltage uh, would be too high uh, we risk ruining the, uh, the CRT and so we want to first check with the uh, multimeter that uh, the 11 volts are correct so time to power on let's see what happens oh, wow, wow. 10.88 well that's not bad that's not bad at all Okay, two socket in its place, everything looks good. So let's power on. Hmm, takes a lot of time. Well, yeah, yeah, it's coming up. It just takes a lot to warm the CRT yeah but why is uh, the snow looks good yeah okay so one last thing uh, uh, would be maybe finding some signal to the easy way to produce an RF output for this uh, TV well a Commodore 64 uh, of course, this is a uh, uh, 300 ohms uh, input and the 64 is a 75 but, well, it's gonna work anyway and yeah so the size is too large, but uh, I don't know where are the controls to regulate that on the on this TV but yeah, it works Okay, for demonstrating uh, a real uh, picture, TV picture, um, look at the DVD player. For some reason I couldn't use the its own RF output. Uh, I couldn't tune the channel, I don't know why. Maybe this DVD is not uh, working on the RF, RF output, I don't know. So instead uh, using uh, uh, RF modulator with video input, uh, uh, audio input and channel 23 which is one of the first channels in the UHF pan and the wire is just taped uh, into the output uh, crude that works and so let's see what we can see with this
manca molto per tu con Cari. No, signore, passeremo tra qualche istante. Grazie. Eh, scusate, scusate se mi permetto, reverendo, ma, ma dalla vostra domanda mi pare di aver capito che volete scendere a tu con Cari. Temo che abbiate sbagliato. Eh, capisco, è seccante, ma per fortuna non è inevitabile. Potrete scendere a San Giuseppe e tornare indietro con il treno della Marina. Perché se vedete, caro reverendo, Questo treno non c'è mai tu con un carico. 